All right. Um, welcome to Picture Perfect Social Media Marketing, um, Photography and Graphics with Lindsay Wilcox. I'm going to turn it over to you, Lindsay. All right. Thanks, Ashley. All right, let me get my slideshow set up. I can never seem to find the button when I need to. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, everyone can see this? Yes. Excellent. Um, so I, if you see me look down, it's to just check the time. Um, and we are starting at about 10.07. I'm going to try to wrap things up by uh, 10.45, 10.50 just so we have some time for sharing some ideas or asking questions. But along the way, feel free to unmute yourself and just chime in either um, to kind of give your own spin on something I've presented or to ask a question. So let's dive in. So the tips that you'll gain today, um, hopefully I can start uh, by giving you some ideas of what to photograph, which I think is especially tricky for social media because it's a 24-7 real-time medium. So there's always this, this pressure to come up with something um, to share or to post. So hopefully you'll have some go-to ideas. Um, then I'm going to go over some photography basics. I will say I am not a professional photographer. Um, I am a marketer. And so I have over almost 20 years in marketing picked up a lot of tips and tricks from working with professional photographers. Um, so what I'm going to share with you is not going to be super in-depth. I'm not going to give you, um, you know, a, a university level course. I'm going to give you practical tips that you can use. So basics of photography. Um, with that, some, some tips and tricks you can put into play and some food photography secrets. I have worked with a few food photographers over the years too. So I've learned some, some crazy things. Um, whenever you see an ad on TV that features uh, food or on social media, that is something just stunningly gorgeous. Chances are a food photographer worked on that. And yes, they use things like glue and uh, paint and just a bunch of uh, inedible things. So um then I will also talk about uh, things you can photograph at the farmer's market. I know, Samantha, you, um, you're not in agriculture, so a lot of this is agriculture uh, related, but I'm hoping you can still glean some tips from this too. Um, but uh, the market refers to the farmer's market, so um, we'll talk a little bit about that too. So the big question, what do I photograph? Um, that is, is definitely uh, you know, something you want to ask yourself. Um, you know, what am I going to take a picture of and why am I going to do it? Um, so in general, you want to take a photo of something remarkable. And I'm not talking about earth shattering, um, you know, blow my mind photography, although that's great if you have some subject like that that's really eye catching and just truly awe inspiring. But in general, I use remarkable to refer to things that are that you would remark upon so something um that cause that would cause you to say something oh that's a beautiful photo of tomatoes or oh that's this or that so remarkable in this sense just means something worthy of remark and so with that i'm just going to ask you to unmute yourselves and ashley you can't answer this uh, but samantha i would just ask you you know is there anything to say or remark about this, uh, this drawing? Um, sure, yeah. Do you uh, want me to know what, tell oh, you Oh yeah, yeah, what, what, what <laughs> comes late, sorry. Um, it's easier when there's more people because it, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot. No, like that's that. okay. Um, but just something that you would remark upon uh, and it takes people a few seconds. It's I often take pictures of the cows in my neighborhood. Yeah. So I definitely am, am drawn to this, but I do see a little rabbit on the left-hand side. I love that. You are the first person that, because I, I, I use this in a lot of my presentations, but you're the first one that's noticed that right away. So you are very observant. Um, uh, anything else to remark on? Um, the little boy in the background. 
or person rather. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. Uh, um, anything else? I mean, just personally, when I take pictures of the cows in my neighborhood, um, I would focus on the mama and baby cow is what I would I would put as my focal point. Yep. That's a good one too. It's so funny when people mention the little boy in the background, I always, it, the Zoom speaker view covers it. So I'm always like, is there a little boy? And then I have to, I'm like, where is he? And I, yeah. Um, yeah. Some people, when I, when this is for people in agriculture, a lot of times they're like, these cows need to be milked stat. <laughs> so, yeah. That um, too. Yeah. And uh, they'll talk about the Holstein, the breed. Um, okay, so next question is, what is there to remark upon now? Uh, the purple cow? Yeah. <laughs> so that one was instant. And and there's a reason that I, I put you on the spot like that. Uh, uh, so that is an example of something remarkable. It's instantaneous. You didn't even have to think about it. I think, if anything, people pause before saying a uh, purple cow because it's so obvious it hits you across the, the face. Um, and that is what we want with our social media photography. We don't want people to have to look and be observant. Um, you know, it's great that you were and you had the time, but that's because I'm saying, hey, I need you to look at this. When we're scrolling our social feeds, we don't have that unless um, there's that trick, you know, where somewhere, I shouldn't say a trick, it's a device uh, where someone starts a story and draws you in and then you, you know, look closer at this photo or this photo and they start a narrative with the text that goes with the graphic. That will maybe cause you to, to look closer. But in general, we just don't have that luxury as social media marketers to, um, you know, we can't, we can't expect someone's going to have five, 10 seconds to look at our image because they're scrolling so fast. So we need to think purple cow. I did not come up with this. This is um, Seth Godin, who's a great um, thought leader in marketing. And it's actually his theory. It's the purple cow theory. And the goal, he says, is to stand out in a field of monochrome Holsteins. So we want to be the purple cow in social media feeds with our images and graphics. So another test besides the purple cow test is to say, would I send this photo to a friend or would I show or tell a friend in real life? Um, usually those things are things that entertain or inform. So something um, entertaining can even be, it doesn't always need to be fun and upbeat. Entertaining is just providing an experience. And so it could be, it could even be a negative emotion, but it's something that, that causes you to feel something. It's kind of like watching a movie, you know, some movies scare us, some movies um, make us cry, some movies make us happy, but we're entertained. Um, information too. So giving a tip or, or uh, a recipe or something that is going to inform. So here's some things to help you, um, you know, should I post this? Uh, the quick thing is that photo is so blank. So it's so clever. It's so funny. It's so beautiful. A lot of times beauty is, that's kind of the dominating factor I'd say on Instagram is beauty. Things that are beautiful and make us go, wow, that's gorgeous. Um, you know, does it tell a story on its own? Like, does the photo, some photos really, you know, photojournalism is all about telling a story through a photo or an image. And some, some photos do tell a story and they really stand on their own. Or like I said, does it go with a longer post that explains it? Um, again, does it spark a quick emotion or reaction? Like, aha, um, I get it. Or, um, that just makes me feel happy inside or awe. That's both awe, like a W W W W awe, like that's so cute or awe, like, wow, that. That just makes me feel, um, you know, that's stunning. And then again, does it showcase something useful or informative? So uh, that's kind of my overview of, you know, what you should photograph. And then we're going to dive into some basics. So again, I told you I am not going to go into um, the seven elements of photography. I do it. If you have 20 minutes, read up on it. Uh, it's, it, it is interesting, but um, we're not going to cover it today. Instead, I kind of have four steps to social media photography. And the first one is purpose. So why are you taking this photo? We are marketers, so we don't, you know, we don't have the luxury of 
taking photos just to take them and explore. And uh, we have a job to do. We have we have a task to accomplish. Now, how we get there, I'll talk about this more. It doesn't always have to be direct, but we do need a purpose with our photos. Um, the subject. So what are we photographing? What is the main subject? And then composition. How are we going to show our subject? And then finally, the style. So are we going to be, uh, you know, bold and modern? Are we going to be soft and subdued? And style really ties into branding. And I went over that in my first webinar, so I'm not going to really go deep here. But um, your brand is really your your organization or business's personality, and it can really come through in in the photos that you take. And we'll talk about that soon. So um, this would just be a, a simple example. This was I took this out of market a few years ago, and I just place the little patty pan squash like gears and you could post something like, you know, we're like these patty pan squash gearing up for the market today. Um, the other thing that's different about this is I used a high contrast and dark background because that's going to grab the eye. And you'll see with some of the photos I take of um, produce and food that I do use a lot of more unexpected backgrounds. A lot of times the go-to is burlap <laughs> uh, or just really natural a lot of greens, because that's what people expect. And when we think about being the purple cow, we want to surprise people. Surprise is a huge um, uh, element to incorporate into your photography and social media, because you are competing with hundreds and thousands of other photos. So my hope would be that this stuck out because it's eye-catching, high contrast, and also surprising. You don't see a lot of black with food. I think um, this may be obvious, uh, but we don't want to be directly selling uh, our products at the at the farmer's market or anywhere um, in person. And we don't want to do that online either. You don't want to be pushy. You don't want to be in your face. That People do not like that. So as in real life, as on social media. So being more subtle is really important. You don't want to do a lot of bursts and, you know, sale, sale, sale. But that's still, you can still sell. It's just an indirect way. So how do you make a sale? You want to build confidence. Again, you want to entertain or inform. You want to provide value and build a relationship. Um, your purpose also, you want to remember, it's not just to be promotional. It also is to, to get emotions involved. Um, and just remember, promotional photos, just they don't do well. Uh, it, I'm sure you've been scrolling through and you see someone pushing something really hard. It just, it kind of cringes you. It's almost like if you want to think about your personal social media feed, it's the person that's always pushing their agenda on you or always talking about themselves. It makes you feel uncomfortable. So we want to avoid that with our photography too. So subject ideas, again, this is going to be specific to farmers markets um, and vendors at the market. But some ideas for your subject would be your actual product in use or, or well, not in use, but being sold at the market, um, at your farm, so harvesting and making the product. Um, the product in use, so being used in recipes or prepped or being eaten by other people. And then product beauty shots. So th this is just some ideas for you. Um, people would be you, which I know makes a lot of us uncomfortable, but yes, people want to know, I mean, there's the whole movement, the get to know who grows your food, um, know your farmer, know your food. So you as the farmer or you as the producer or the figurehead of your organization, people want to know you. So as uncomfortable as it makes you, uh, it has to, it really has to happen so you can build that relationship. Uh, other vendors, um, people at the farm or business. So whether it's people visiting or other employees and then your friends, your family, your pets. Again, people want to know uh, people. So they want to know what life is like on your farm and, and what you're up to. So how do you define your subject in the photo? It's usually obvious, uh, but one of the, the most prominent tactics out there is to simply put the subject in focus. So that's using our trusty portrait mode on our smartphones or just positioning our photo so that the um, subject is in, um, you know, in sharp focus. 
And uh, yeah, you, it's simple. Just use your portrait mode or just tap on the subject you want in focus. Now with autofocus, you're not going to get that blur. So you're going to have to use other strategies to ensure people know what the subject is. And that may be having the subject take up the most amount of space or be the brightest or most defined, um, you know, everything else may be in the shadows. But that's where your creativity comes in is how do you make sure people know what the subject is? Remember, people don't have time to study this like a photography class. They need to know right away what you're trying to show. Um, micro photography is, is a, a great strategy. And that's where you use that same sharp focus on one area of, um, of a product probably not a person. No one wants to be that up close to someone. Um, but this is a great way to show that the subject maybe is quality. Maybe you're really trying to show how fresh and juicy and delicious this corn is. A great way to do that is bring people right up close. Um, people, that's often our biggest subject. You can look at, um, you know, are the subjects aware? So here, obviously, I ask these people, can I take your photo? And it's very obvious they're looking right at me at the camera. And then over in the other photo, um, there's a group of people and they are, it looks, they, they were just like this, but I quickly said, hey, do you guys mind? I'm, I'm posting for Selvin Catskills Farmers Markets. I just wondered, you know, are you okay being, you know, on our social media feed? I said it much faster and <laughs> I grabbed a couple photos and I said, just pretend I'm not here. And I'd say for the most part, they did a good job. Um, but we'll talk more about getting permission. Um, another reason to have your subject be a person or you is uh, this was a study at Georgia Tech that Instagram, uh, people favor faces on Instagram and they get more likes and engagement. So Again, that even if you're uncomfortable, this is a, a bottom line reason to consider putting your face in the photo. So this is one area that I will go into that is more theoretical with photography. Um, you can read, there's so much information on rule of thirds, so you can read about this on, online. Um, but this is a composition rule with photography, and it also can help you position your subject in a way that's going to be the most impactful. So here we have our little tic-tac-toe board. And all you would do is put, put this over your photo or what you're going to take a photo of. Um, all you need to do is uh, go to your settings and your smartphone. It may already be on, but um, just uh, click on grid and turn on the grid. And this will show up whenever you take a photo. And it will adjust no matter if you're doing your vertical, horizontal, square, it doesn't matter, it will adjust. And what the rule of thirds is, is it's a theory that the middle rectangle, so uh, if you look at the middle rectangle, those four points that surround that rectangle are high visibility, or, or the, the eye is drawn there. Um, and you may want to consider putting your subject on one of those points. The other kind of trigger points for our eye are placing subjects along or near the intercept, or I'm sorry, the, the lines that run both parallel and horizontal. Um, the other thing you can do is think of your photo in thirds. So maybe someone takes, if you're doing a portrait, someone takes up two thirds, the, the right two thirds of the portrait um, or the left two thirds. So it, it prevents you from taking a photo that I'm sure you've seen these photos and they just look, they're boring, is dividing your photo in half. So if someone was taking a photo of the ocean, they would put, you know, the bottom half would be the ocean and the top half would be the sky. So that is, that is not the rule of thirds. That's, you know, that's, I guess, the rule of halves um, where things just look kind of boring. The goal here with the rule of thirds is to get the eye moving and excite the eye. Um, and there's a lot of other intricacies, which I'm going to go into. And the first one is that with the rule of thirds, this is kind of called the power position where it's the bottom right corner. And uh, the reason this is where the eye is drawn is because we read left to right uh, in English. So in other languages, this is going to be opposite, but 
in English, uh, we le read left to right. And so what we end on is what our eye lingers on. So same kind of concept with menus. Um, restaurants typically put the most expensive uh, or the highest margin item in the bottom right hand corner. So watch for that if you don't, don't want to spend too much at, at a restaurant. Um, so here in this photo, you know, I'm trying to spotlight the Aaron Burr Cidery. So uh, this is what is most prominent in this photo. I mentioned this dividing your subject into thirds just makes things it just moves your eye around. So you're, you'll see, I'm a big fan of putting things in the foreground. I like putting, putting flowers in the foreground. Um, it just adds some visual interest, but you don't, you wouldn't want to have the market tents be smack dab in the middle of the photograph and the sky and the upper half. It just, it's not exciting. The yeah, also another thing that I found too, is to try and take the whole picture, try not to cut off too much. So in this example, you can see the top and bottom of the market tent. I haven't cut any legs off. Um, <laughs> a lot of times you'll see photographs where someone just chops the feet off and it looks strange. Um, you wouldn't realize it, but when you see a lot of professional photography, they don't like to remove you know, <laughs> body parts from the photo. So again, the more you can get in the whole picture, the better, especially when you're taking um, photos of the market. Uh, again, as I mentioned, foreground perspective. Um, remember those kind of power lines of the, the grid line. So here I have the market tents. Um, it's not in the bottom corner, but you, you can't do that all the time. Um, but I do have them along that that um, top line there so that your eye is drawn to it. And that, that should be kind of your focal point. The reason I, I do like to put flowers or bright colors or something in the in the foreground is it's unexpected. So the, the flowers add something. I, there's only, if you run a market or you vend at a market, there's only so many photos of the market that you can do. Um, it starts looking boring. So if you, if you put something in front of what you're photographing, it adds interest and color. And again, when you're scrolling on social media, hopefully this yellow will draw you in and you'll say, oh, there's the market. Um, breathing room is a good thing in design in general, not just photography, because as we're saying, we're trying to give people's eyes a workout. So they're moving around and exploring. You also want to give the eyes a break. So breathing room, um, white space, it's all, it's all good in photos. So that's why, you know, it's okay that we have grass and sky and a tree line, uh, because that gives the eye a break. Um, another strategy to make sure you get the whole picture when you're taking photos of crowds, um, just back up as far as you can. And you can always do a wide angle photo so you can, and then you can crop it later if you want to zoom in. Uh, I mentioned this later, but I'll mention it now. When you're doing crowd shots like this, you can't really identify people. Um, unless you're really, really trying. So in general, you don't need to go around and get permission from this entire crowd of people because the subject is the market itself. The subject is not an individual person. So um, when you're taking crowd shots, as long as they're really back far away, in general, you're going to be fine from a legal perspective. Um, I, I always like to do my disclaimer. It's not legal advice. Talk to your lawyer. Talk to your company's lawyer if, if in doubt. Uh, this is one of my all-time favorite photos. It's from the Farmhouse Project, and they have uh, given the Catskills uh, Farmers Markets permission to use this, which was very generous of them. But I love this photo because it actually breaks the concept I just talked about, which is the rule of thirds and having the focal point be along the lines and everything. This is a very central, central focused composition where your eye is drawn right smack dab into that center square. Um, and that's okay. You don't always have to follow this rule of thirds. The, the point is you don't always want everything to be center focused because that gets old and that gets boring. Um, so this, this is an example of breaking the rules. And in a way, there's still some nice flow. You have the upper, um, you do have some rule of thirds at work here with the upper um, third being the sky, the middle being the market, and the bottom being the, the ground. Um, but I, I just love this photo. 
It also uses, and I'll show an example of this soon, but it uses the tilt shift uh, filter, or I'm not sure they may have actually used it on their, on their camera, but that uh, blurs certain parts of the photo and then puts other parts that they want you to focus on in focus. So as you can see, the sky is blurred, the ground is blurred, but the people are very sharp in the market tense, and that's what the focus is. Um, this is a screenshot of the Masterclass program, and these are just some examples of portraits. So if you're ever shooting a portrait of yourself or somebody, um, the, this is how the rule of thirds works. If you want to picture two eyes, um, that's in general um, where you want those two dots to line up with. Um, the, the eyes kind of line up right on that grid in general. Um, as you can see, Issa Rae has her, um, you know, she's at an angle, which is a way to kind of play with that composition. But in general, even, um, you know, famous photographers, they use this kind of composition for portraits. Um, scale is really a, a great strategy to get your photos noticed because for the most part, everything is zoomed in and up close. Um, this is me and my dad. Um, we're in front of a brewery in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And, um, you know, we are the subject. We're in that power position in the bottom right. But we're also, um, you know, part of a larger photo. So scale might draw someone's eyes in. And then once they're into your photo, then they're going to look down in the bottom right. Creativity with composition. Um, that goes a long way. Uh, these. I'll mention this again and give you the website, but I use Pixabay or Pexels.com. These are um, photography sites where the photographer has said, hello, general public, you may use my photos. You don't need to pay me or give me permission, um, which is very rare. For the most part, you need to buy stock photography. So um, this is a great resource if you need free images um, and if you want inspiration. So anyways, these, this photo I love, is just, you know, an ice cream cone in front of a cloud. Um, you've probably all seen those uh, photos where it looks like someone's holding the sun. But can you do that with your produce? Is there any kind of whimsical, creative um, composition that you could do uh, playing around with scale? Um, sort of some fun with, with food, your food products. I think powdered sugar, you can do a lot of different symbols and logos. Um, that is someone's, I love this out of, out of waffles. It's someone's little artwork using fruit and making Tetris. So just thinking outside the box and how you can use creativity in your composition. So the last part of, you know, the basics of photographer from photography for me is, is the style of your photo. So this is Chacha Macha. It's a, um, New York city kind of tea tea and um, your frozen yogurt spot. And everything they do is pretty much green and pink, as you can see in their Instagram feed. Uh, obviously, you see some blue mixed in, but for the most part, that's their color palette and they're sticking to it. So that means when you're scrolling through Instagram, you're going to see their colors and subtly probably know, okay, that's Chacha Macha's photo. So maybe you have a predominant background that you use. Maybe you always use a gingham background for your photos. So people will start knowing, oh, that's such and such farm's produce because I see that tablecloth. They always use that tablecloth. Another way that you could brand your, um, or yeah, brand your photos or define your style um, is, is kind of the tone of the, the photo. Is it bright and upbeat? Like Chacha Mach is very bright and upbeat. Or is it classic, maybe even serious? It all goes back to what your brand is and how you want to convey that in your photos. Um, some brands will use a specific filter all the time. So that's another thing. Um, you know, you have, I think there's 18 filters now on Instagram. And there's even filters now on Facebook. Um, kind of crazy ones too. Uh, but e either way, you're going to be tempted sometimes because you may get bored you as the manager of your social media feed, you're, you think, you know, I want to mix things up and use this duotone filter to make my photos really, this photo really crazy because yesterday the, the filter I used was more subtle. So 
you have to rein that in because your customers, they need consistency. They, in general, you should try and use kind of similar filters and not go wild all the time because while you're having fun and mixing things up, you're just confusing your customer. They want to, they want consistency and they want to know immediately. Remember, it's that instant reaction. They want to know who took, you know, what, what business took this photo? What am I looking at? And if you use a consistent filter, that's a way to do that or a consistent color palette. Um, I just, I like this um, photo. It's just a great way to show personality. So how can you inject your personality, um, you as the farmer or the um, representative of your business? How can you showcase your, your personality through your photos? Another way to add style in a very literal way is to add um, graphics, text, or colors. So creating a graphic out of your photo. Um, this kind of veers slightly away from photography and into graphic design, but it's important to mention because we all see um, photos on social media that have text overlay. Again, use the same font if you can and try to be consistent there if you are going to do text overlay on your photos. I would recommend using this very sparingly because people want to see photos on social media. It, that's Instagram started as a selfie app. That's its true nature. So kind of use, use graphic and text very, very sparingly. Um, and when you do, just make sure that you don't put a ton of text. So this is the actually CCE Sullivan's um, social media feed. And you see photo, photo, photo. But then there's one graphic that says one in 10 are food insecure in the Sullivan in, <clears throat> Sullivan Catskills. So it's it should kind of jump out to you. And that's a mission that they had to, to raise some funds and awareness for this program. So they did it with purpose. And they did it in a way that ties into their brand. That orange is the color of the Sullivan Fresh logo. I have a question about that, yep. Lindsay. Is it okay yep. to take a break to ask? Work. Yeah, because um, I'm always out of breath when I when I go through this section. So go ahead. Um, since this is our Instagram account, and we have a few that are you know for different programs, and actually we do use maybe even more, maybe so, more so in the past, we do use this um, graphics kind of uh, like the one you're talking about more. And okay. we're sort of, um, yeah, I'm curious. I'll say for the Sullivan Catskills Farmers Market page, we have a lot of graphics and not as many photos, but like obviously fresh photos are great too. Um, I wonder if there's a balance that you recommend basically yeah, like, I mean, I've seen I a lot say, of Instagrams. They have like, um, like straight down the middle line will be all their graphics and then all their pictures will be on the side or they, they make sure they plan it out so that the grid looks perfect or something is maybe. Oh, so question. yeah. I am not a fan of like a meticulous <laughs> grid. So yeah. And I just, I'm like, easy. I can't achieve this. I don't yeah, know. Stop, what the, best don't stop the madness because in reality, <laughs> it's kind of like, it's almost like your website, you know, people mm -hmm. are, they're not necessarily going to go to your website. They're pro if they do, they're going to one page to get the information. They're going there from Google, right? Mm -hmm. How often do we actually go to, we Google things and then we get to the landing page. It's, it's rare to type in, you know, www.ccsullivan.org because it's just not, we, we are all Googlers. So it's the same with Instagram and, and, and Facebook. I think it's kind of rare that people are going to, the main interaction they're going to have is when they're scrolling through their feed and see your graphics. And then maybe they're going to click and, and go over to Facebook or Instagram and see your feed. But yeah, the, the whole, it, it's, it's one of those things that I think is kind of self congratulatory. Like, look at me, I made the perfect grid that has something down the middle line and it, it can get crazy. And I, I think that that is just not, don't worry about that. It's not how people use your photos. They're mainly seeing them as they scroll by. So your goal is to get them to stop and and before they even get to your feed, they have to stop and click on the photo and read more or see the comments or if it's a album, scroll through the album. So um, you know, I, I would let that go. And as far as your question about how often do you do the the graphics, 
I think, you know, this would be ideal. So once out, you know, one out of every nine, but I mean, even if you do it one out of four, I think is fine. Okay. It's just so the predominant, it's not, it should never be more than the photos themselves. And do you think the same since, uh, just to use myself as an example, I often just do the same for Facebook and Instagram rather than create um, unique images or unique posts for both. Um, even though the yeah. read is a little different for each audience, um, it's just a time saver and sort of the capacity I have. Yep. Do you have any, do you, the recommendation would stay the same since Facebook is involved? Or yeah. So the if graphics you're talking- play well on Facebook or yeah. they play better on Facebook. So I would always say Facebook should have more posts. So withholding some off of Instagram can prevent someone from feeling like, oh, why am I seeing the same thing? The other thing is, remember, people aren't seeing things in real time. You know, you'll see a post from a friend five days ago. The algorithms are always at work. So it's very rare if someone's going, unless they're like your top fan, and then in which case they'll be like, yay, more CC Sullivan stuff. Um, they're not going to see, let's say you post the the seedlings or the planting in the upper left-hand corner. The The odds of someone logging onto Facebook and seeing that within a minute and then logging onto Instagram and seeing that within a minute are so slim. You, you, the person may not see it at all on either medium or just one of them. So I think it's just fine to cross post. I really do. It's, it is a time saver and we're busy. We're not running multi-million dollar campaigns here. If you do have the time and the you... I would just withhold because Facebook people are more tolerant of graphics and in a little more promotional stuff on Facebook, just use your pure photos on Instagram and kind of withhold some of the more promotional or flyers. I know CC will post a lot of flyers about events and just withhold those. So don't click the post on Instagram button. Great. That's really helpful. Thank you for the tip. Okay. And, uh, and I'm really sorry. I, this, is only, this is the first time I've given this presentation. And it's already 1045 and I'm not even halfway through. So (laughs) I'm going to try and speed through this, but I'm not going to be done until I will finish by 11, but we may not have that much time for questions and I can stick around. But if you guys don't, can't, no worries. Um, So yeah, here's just some quick examples of using text. Um, That font over on the market fresh salsa. So I talked about fonts. Um, Those are fonts that we use for the Sullivan Catskills Farmer's Market. So it's on brand. Um, The Apple season, it's on. It's That's a project um, for Onondaga County. So that's everything says it's on, O-N, emphasized. So these are just some examples of graphics you can make. And these are the two programs I recommend. You can add text through Instagram or through Facebook. And there's some great options, but I... I also emphasize use the same font. Please use the same font um, and not switch and flip flop around. Just keep consistent and one that ties into your brand. These are great programs. They're free and they can help you create images with text and graphics. So here's some quick tips and tricks. Um, so we're going to veer away from conceptual and go right into practical. So here are my three cucumbers and I just, you know, took this the other day. The one on the left is indoors and the one on the right is outdoors. And, and I took these quickly intentionally. I didn't mess with filters. I didn't do anything. I just took a quick photograph using the auto settings. And you can see the difference for yourself. Um, take photos outside whenever possible or use natural light. That's the biggest rule um, that I have learned and I've put into play and it makes a huge difference. Natural light trumps all. Um, you can also mess around with your background to use bright colors or interesting elements that might draw the eye in. Again, thinking of your photo among hundreds of others in a quick two minute scroll, what can make it stand out? So maybe that bright pink you don't see, um, in food often. So it it almost looks like candy and maybe that's going to draw someone in because really you're selling cucumbers. (laughs) So tricking someone a little bit visually can go a long way. Um, This is talk about cringing. (laughs) This is me. Um, But I just wanted to quickly show you some um, no-nos, which is to have your light source behind you, typically unless you're doing a stylized photo where you want to emphasize the silhouette. So if I wanted to emphasize my 
the shape of my head or the shape of, let's say, a tomato or some other piece of produce, sure, go ahead and use a backlight. But in general, it's ter terrible <laughs> for taking photos, especially of yourself. Um, artificial direct light. So it's not just artificial light that is is can be problematic. Think high noon is a is a bad time to take photos of yourself because you're creating shadows when light is directly overhead. Um, that's not the case if you're taking a flat lay photo. So where the the uh, like that cucumber photo that would be great for noon because you're getting that flood of bright bright light right on your subject. But in general. Um, direct and artificial light create shadows. Shadows are not flattering. And then we have natural light, even better, natural light from the side. So that's going to be softer and gentler on your features. All right. Oh, there's more of me. <laughs> um, so I, I am guessing you already know this, but um, if you're taking a portrait of yourself or someone else, do not angle your phone up. Do not angle your phone directly on yourself, angle it um, from above. So if you're taking a selfie, lift your arm up so that it's um, the phone is uh, above your eyes because that's gonna um, just be more flattering as you can see here. <laughs> so it, it is just a more flattering angle. Um, and again, why am I talking about selfies in a, you know, in a social media photography class for business because people want to see you. So you do want to take photos of yourself and let people know you. Um, try to avoid getting, as you can see in these photos, my arm is kind of hidden. You wouldn't necessarily know I took the photo, but here it's very obvious. So be aware of the telltale arm if you want it to look like someone took your photo, um, which is fine. It's going to give you a more professional um, feel to your photo. Just, just beware of the arm. Crop the arm out if need be. Um, a lot of times on Instagram and Facebook, we just go right to filters and that's okay. We're busy. Um, but I just wanted to show you, uh, what you can do when you manually edit your photo. Uh, and this is an example in Instagram, but you could edit your photo directly, whether you have an Android or Apple device, right on using that, uh, that uh, iPhone or Android phone using that native editing um, kind of palette. So this is the before and after. Um, this is what I did to fix it. And this took me like 30 seconds because a lot of this is just what looks good. It doesn't need to be scientific. Um, the biggest one, I, I, I'm a fan of the tilt shift. Some people do not like it, but again, that can help you emphasize your subject. And in this case, it was the produce itself because it was talking about a specific vendor. So the first thing I did was blur out the people. You still know you're at the market, but I blurred them out. And then I bumped up the saturation. So saturation is a great one to kind of go to because it's going to just make your photo look more vibrant. Saturation is just the amount of color in each, um, you know, in your subject. Contrast is going to make things pop a little bit. And then brightness is a big one. That just helps things kind of stand out. And then finally, what I did was I cropped. So I got rid of distracting elements like that market tent um, post, the grass hiding through the table, and it just tightened up and cleaned up my photo. So now we're going to go into food photography. And this is this is probably 1% of what you could learn about food photography, but these are the things that I found most useful. Um, using vertical photos on Instagram is so, and Facebook is so powerful because vertical photos, um, when you're scrolling, not when you're looking at the grid, like going to um, your Instagram page, things will look square. But when you're scrolling, vertical photos uh, are allowed now on Instagram, and they have been for a while, but people do not utilize them. They still take the square photo. But your goal is to kind of occupy someone's mindset and, and grab their attention. A vertical photo gives you a nanosecond longer to do that because it's more space on the screen. So consider that when you are taking photos to try some vertical orientation. Um, the other thing that's great about this photo is, yes, it's composed and it probably took a long time, but it's it's in a rainbow order, which is really eye-catching. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, neither of you, I was thinking maybe we'd have a meat farmer, but you're going to learn for the next minute about photographing meat. And I'm sorry, but uh, it is interesting. So interested. hold on. Uh, let me see here. Okay, so I just had to move my um, my view screen. So meat, if you the, take a photo of it indoors, is typically going to look it skews towards blue, uh, and it it looks blue is unappetizing in general uh, with food. Warmer hues are going to make you you feel like eating something. Um, blurring is not good with meat because it's unknown, and we do not of all things we don't want our meat to look vague and unknown. Um, the light background is also not ideal with meat. You want to go darker and richer. So dark wood, um, a slate, like a chalkboard, dark, uh, black is going to look great. Um, the worst, the sin of this photo is the shining. So the glistening glossy look of the meat is just gross. Um, and the lighting is direct. You can see because it's shining in the middle there and it's shining everywhere. And so we know we have some direct light at play and that is not good. This is, this is from Pixabay, but this is great meat photography. Um, it's a nicely trimmed um, meat so you can see the grain. It's dark background. There's sea salt and greenery. So we're not just looking at raw meat. We're envisioning how this might be prepared. Raw meat, uh, this is a really good photo because it is raw meat and it doesn't look unappetizing. So there is a blur here, but it's not, It even with the blur, you can tell what it is. You can see, oh, that's some nice marbling back there. I'm okay with that. Um, and it's just, it's a more visually appealing. It's also a warmer. So talking back about some of those adjustments you can make to your photo, this photo has definitely been warmed up. So you're not seeing any blue tint. It's actually, if you kind of flip, you can see. This is more blue, almost purple, and this is more of a rich red. So that's that's some meat meat tricks for you. What's tough is at the farmer's market, meat has to be sold frozen. So a, a way to do that is maybe to mix it with other products or do a nice overhead shot, and maybe not zoom in that much because you're not gonna, zooming in on frozen meat doesn't tell a story. This tells a story. Oh, this is a dairy farmer and they also have beef, they have sausage. So maybe just not going in so close with meat at the market. Um, here's an example. I, I love the flat lay. Some people say it's overdone, but I think it's a great way to tell a story. Um, this is someone I found on Instagram, but they're veggie juice concoction. And they're actually showing every, this is a, a recipe that you could technically follow if you wanted to make it at home. <laughs> oh, there go my dogs. I'm so sorry. Um, Here's another uh, flat lay that is a recipe flat lay. So um, when you do a recipe, a recipe, you want to show the finished product. And you also want to show a few of the raw ingredients next to it. So, um, and as you notice here, this is nice because it, it doesn't use the rule of thirds. We have the quiche and the two thirds of the photo. Um, and we also have some other elements. So the eye moves around this. It's a, a great photo. I, I like abstract and bold uh, photographs because they're going to capture attention. And if this fits within your brand, I would urge you to, to use it. Just think of the color wheel. And that's an easy way to think how you can incorporate some contrast into your photos. Um, and then you draw them in and then they read the caption. So the last section is at the market. So some just some quick tips for photographing um, at the market. So unfortunately, market tents, while they are colorful and attract attention in real life, when we're trying to attract attention on uh, Facebook or Instagram, uh, the photos that are taken underneath a market tent tend to look funny because the bright, let's say blue, is going to do what it does to this photo, which looks almost like you're in a club and the tablecloth is glowing. So it's, it's not the most flattering. So you have to get, uh, I would probably... Uh, take a different angle here, maybe straight on or zoom in really closely on uh, what the chef is preparing. The other thing you got to watch for is shadows and light with the tent. So you, as you can see here, you've got a, a mixture of 
shadow and, and light and it's not really doing anything for this photo. Quick fix here would just be to crop out the overly sunny um, uh, cucumbers and try and make do with what you have there. Here is uh, an example of using some bright color and an unexpected shape. It's a kind of a pyramid of radishes. And I think that pink and purple, it's really the purple cow, literally, when you can use purple and pink in your photos, those colors almost are fluorescent and can draw your eye in. Um, the leaves too are almost fluorescent. And these are unexpected colors that you don't see used a lot in um, market photos. Again, it's always a lot of greens and browns and earthy palettes. If you're going to take a photo of a customer, which I think is, is fun and it tells a story, this is one of those, this tells a story. This is a customer. She, uh, this was years ago, but she literally was so happy um, with what she was buying. And so that was her genuine expression. And I just said, hey, do you mind if I you know, take your photo for Facebook? And she said, sure. And she was buying more stuff. You also want to be mindful if you're taking photos, um, you know, that you're not disrupting a sale for yourself or someone else. But on the other hand, if, if you can try and grab some of these photos, they're going to go a long way with your marketing because they tell a story. Um, taking people behind the scenes is a great way to tell a story as well. So you usually envision photos of markets being full, crowded. This one is actually everyone setting up and prepping for the market. So that would be a great thing to do. You show up an hour early, give people a sneak peek of setting up for the market and say, it's going to be busy today. We're setting up now. I'll see you in a few hours. Uh, I use this a lot. Um, my friend that's a photographer said, you know, the, the angle, people always take photos straight on. But if you, if you look at professional photographers, they're always squatting. They're always standing. They're doing crazy things. And that's because angles can tell stories as well. So um, this is an unexpected angle where I crouch down and, and, um, shot upwards. So you're, the focus again is on the produce because that's what we're selling, but you see a transaction happening above you and it just, it's different. It's a different way of looking at uh, a, a vendor at the farmer's market. Playing with kind of breaking the grid, breaking your, your rule of thirds. This is a way to do that with lines that are going in diagonal directions. So there's a lot of funky angles and directions here. Overhead shots, they're very popular with food. Um, when you do it, because they're so, uh, I would almost say overutilized on Facebook and Instagram, try and come up with a fun or remarkable caption because overhead shots do tend to get become background noise with food. So something like, I don't know, I just bought the first, you know, trust me, these are delicious. I just bought, or I just sold the first one. Uh, what? It's the end of the presentation. I can't come up with anything clever right now. But, you know, coming up with the caption that is going to get extra mileage out of an overhead shot is great. Or maybe you do um, an Instagram uh, post where there's two and the next one is just one left. Sometimes just drawing someone's eyes in and having them say, huh, what is that? And that's where that kind of macro photography comes in, where you are looking really, you're taking something small and making it big. So this is soap, but at first glance, it might be um, perceived as art, uh, or someone may say, what is that? And it's going to draw them in. So those are some tips and tricks. And that, uh, oh, I knew there was one more thing, legal stuff. I already went over. Um, where to get your photos from, but really quick. When you take photos of someone, if you really want to cover yourself, um, you can have them sign a photo release form. It looks scary, but um, it's, I didn't post the second page. They just need to sign and say, I give you permission to use my um, photo on social media. This is especially important if you want to use someone's photo in a brochure or on your website, you, you should get a photo release form. Um, this is something you should talk to your lawyer before you, you, you know, do this, but, um, photo release forms, especially for kids. If you want a picture of a kid, 
Um, these are going to be great. You get a release form from their parent that says, okay, you can use little Johnny or little Susie in your brochure. These are those two sites I mentioned. N never steal photos from Google Images and don't regram someone's photo off Instagram without their permission. And that is it. So um, thank you. And let's see, I'm only one minute over. <laughs> so um, any questions or comments? I thought that was great, Lindsay. I felt like I talked really fast. I'm sorry. Um, I had a quick thought just on your last comment. Um, what was I going to exactly ask? Let me think about how I want to phrase okay. it. <laughs> Did you have any thoughts, Samantha? Are you still with us? I am. Thank you. That was great. Um, I think specifically for self and 180, it's difficult because we don't provide any services. So we're not like a farmer at the farmer's market selling yeah. apples. But I do, I, I like the, I definitely notice when we post faces of us, not random faces, but of us and people in the community, that's when we get the biggest response. Yeah, I I, I think there's a, an issue with businesses and, and farm or any business where they feel like they need to sell their product. So they're always showing, or maybe in your case with services, they have to sell their services. But it's really like I said, it's not a direct sale, you're indirectly selling. So you need to sell the people and build the relationships and doing that is you have to put people in the photos. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it can be challenging, but it's worth it for sure. So. That's helpful. Um, I remember my thought it's, um, I do a lot of this and I just wanted to, uh, get your feedback since, um, in terms of regramming, I do a lot of story. Yes, sharing. I know. I, which is great. Based, it's like a content, yeah. you know, otherwise I'd have to actually think of content all the time. And that's just, in, yeah. you know, there's only so much, right? So um, I took the Sullivan Catskills Farmer's Market page as like an opportunity to share literally any vendor's post at any time. So if you're a vendor at a farmer's market and you've posted something yeah. cool, I'll share it and say some comment about where you sell at the farmer's market, okay. like which farmer's market when. Um, or if it's like off season, um, who they are, something like that. I think you're fine. Think I both? think you're totally fine okay. because I think it's most more, people appreciate it or they say thank yes, you or something. I was just going to say, just ignore and it. that's because of your relationship. So I think same with Samantha with like Sullivan 180, like if you're highlighting one of your partners and their services, I don't think you necessarily need permission to regram their post because it's also business. It's businesses sharing businesses and giving them love. I think it's more regramming when it's someone that's uh, you're taking maybe a photo from like if I had taken a photo like this photo, I let's say I stole it off Instagram and I didn't put the Instagram handle there. It's from mm -hmm. Pixabay, but um, you know, that would be, that's more what I'm talking about. So I think you're totally fine. Okay. Um, and there's one thing I have to correct if anyone watches this recording is I always get macro and micro it's macro photography is of uh, the, small minutia of an object, not micro. So I, it, I should have said macro. <laughs> That's, you probably caught that. I mean, it's you nodding your head, but yes. So that was my mistake. I always get it mixed up, but it's a, it's really, it is, especially for food when it's, when it's telling a good story, macro photography is really helpful. So, so any other things you've noticed that work well for you with photography? Um, your your side by side of the cucumbers was shocking, but not shocking because obviously a good background is is eye catching. But seeing them next to each other was really it showcased how much of a difference it makes. Yeah, yeah, and I'm so glad that you said that because I think if I just showed a picture of the cucumbers, the one outside, you'd be like, okay, that's fine, that's a normal photo, but. I wanted to show how bad it looks indoors. And the thing is like, we, we have um, quartz countertops that we like, we adore they We think they're so pretty. They are sparkly. And like, so if I didn't know what I know and I've learned over the years, it'd be like my pretty sparkly countertop, white, clean, 
will make a great background and I have a light overhead, you know, that's shining right on it. It sounds good. It seems good. But when you do it, it's just like, yuck. Um, and that's the same with people too. It's like a bright light um, overhead. Everyone's illuminated, but like it really can make people look just not their best. So, yeah. Yeah, that was a helpful tip. I often, I think I, I know that on some level, but I try to cheat because all the good stuff happens in the kitchen and you just yes, you go outside you go or bring the food outside mm-hmm. or just move it by a window. And I should have mentioned that too. Like just go to a window and actually a window is great because it's soft. It's coming in on the side. So that's usually good as opposed to just coming straight down. Like I said, the high noon is bad too. So sometimes outside can be just as bad. So Uh, but yeah I appreciate everyone sticking around for this and um, thank you Lindsay I I hope you found it useful definitely and this will go up on our marketing page as well Um, I'll probably send out an email now that we're through our series to send out to kind of um, our constituents and or just to remind people that they're available for viewing okay and you'll be on that (laughs) okay (laughs) <laughs> oh, that means someone could technically watch all of these. Okay. And I, yeah, <laughs> verify. Okay. Yeah. We'll have a, tr- we have a tracker, so I'll let you know how many people did. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, it's nice to meet you, Samantha. And it was good nice to, to meet you, you Ashley. Too. And nice um, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Same to you. Okay. Bye. Thanks. So, bye, ladies. Bye.